hacking the wall as well with JU, right? So give a big hand for him. through uh, this web tool as a, as a bit of a handy research tool, talk a little bit about um, possible page systems and then um, the, the media stuff, cracking airplanes and listening to satellites. So a little bit about me to begin with. I've always loved electronics and, and radio. When I was little, obviously, I, um, I just imagined it, but now that I've, I've learned a couple of skills that I try and actually uh, this is uh, an amateur radio antenna set up to receive the spy number station out of Guam, run by British intelligence, called Cherry Rock. Um, unfortunately, when we set it up, it was no longer operational. Um, another thing that's, that's good to know about my work is this is my manifesto. This was supposed to be a prime number counter, and I naturally didn't all the planning out on paper to come up with the optimal solution, I just started plugging the chips and wires in. So I like to make things complicated just because I can. So firstly, RF map. Just out of interest, has anybody heard of this or used it before? Oh, wow. Okay, great. Um, a bit of background. This all started when I was looking at the field test mode um, in the Nokia 3310. This is a bit of hardware that lets you go up to a computer via a serial port and then get information about uh, your local cell neighborhood. Uh, you can extract the data using GAMU, which is a nice open source um, project. Chuck in Wireshark and it gives you some information like cell ID and all this sort of stuff that never can broadcast me. Um, some of the information that it gives you is, is this. Um, project Black Sphere is reverse engineering quite a bit, but this wasn't. Um, if you take a look at it, look at it, and, and things kind of pop out, evidently it becomes the RSSI of the neighboring cells that you and I thought, well, I'll hook up the GPS, drive around, and see if I can't find any images. This is one cell that I was monitoring. Obviously, as you can see, the further away you get, um, the less signal you get. To actually put all this together, my idea was to do geolocation. So you use the power of neighboring cells at your location to determine your position if you didn't have GPS. To do this, though, to check the accuracy, you need to figure out where the base stations actually were. And you can do that by hitting up the government's register. But um, if you do that, it's actually not the best website. Uh, and I figured, well, I just I'll make one. And this is what it looks like now. This is actually the data set visualized as um, Google Maps tiles overlaid on the normal map. This is every single site in Australia with um, every single link between every site that's registered. Uh, underneath that, you've got the shuttle, um, topographic missions, terrain data, and the grace map. Um, that's the, the nice view of that. If you were to zoom in, you get all the sites that are registered in the database as sites that you can click on site markers. Um, the links look a bit nicer as you zoom in, and also you can get your own information. It's nicely overlaid, so it, it was good because I knew that the, the data matched. Uh, and that's what it looks like on the models right here. If you open up a particular marker, you get everybody that's, that's there. You've got some uh, Vodafone cell sites as well as some aviation frequencies. Um, if you show the radiation factor for an antenna, you can see the sort of rough direction and the rough power output, just purely comparative. Um, and links between sites, if you click on this is a Bureau of Neurology one, and they're sending data up. So if you click on the link, it takes you to the other side, up to here, and gives you all that kind of information. If you're brave and you want to burn JavaScript CPU cycles, you can click on one of the next G sites and link to every other one in the country. Um, that was a good, good thing to run current through. Um, and these are every single um, every single base station belonging to each carrier in the country. Obviously, if you compare them, you can see the difference in coverage. The, the color is obviously related to the carrier. You can tell who that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is another a new feature. You can select your carrier, and I've actually highlight all of the new cell towers that have been put in since I think late last year. And Obviously, one particular company has been trying very hard to make up for a lack of coverage. Um, once you actually get all that antenna information and look at the radiation profile, this is a directional antenna. You can make pretty graphics, and then you can apply it to the map. So this is actually my neighborhood, and it's like a radiation heat map. You can see where the directional stuff is, where the omni stuff is, um, and it's 
that's just sort of interesting to visualize that. Uh, all the amateur radio operators are, are on there. Um, this is me in Sydney, and these are all my other fellow hands around the place. Um, it tra ca keeps track of the most popular sites. So the first one's actually a dude wireless site that everybody hit up, I don't know why. Uh, a friend posted this to Reddit a while ago, and it turns out that um, <laughs> these, are, these are occupying position two, three, and four. This is uh, out of Geraldton. You can see the radar homes there. Uh, if you actually click on the markers, you don't obviously get anything particularly helpful. Uh, this is yeah. Gap. Yeah. Uh, there's only one there, and it's one HF link, not particularly helpful. And the one up at uh, Exmouth. I don't know who follows aviation um, incidents, but there are a couple of Qantas flights that experience major upsets. If you remember, there was that one that was going through, pitched up, and then suddenly pitched down, and everybody got injured. This is probably not what happened, but purely speculative, maybe some moisture got caught in the radiators of this massive antenna and transmitted some harmonic and upset the um, air data inertial reference unit, causing it to, to go to like haywire. Who knows? Bit of a side note, the first day I watched this, um, the US Department of Justice, Parliament House, and New South Wales Attorney General's Department all visited the site, um, probably just to make sure that I hadn't broken the law. I don't know how. Also, um, Bolivian hackers tried to get in, and consequently the entire country has been. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be referring back to Aaron Matt as a, as a research tool for these things. So the, the first bit of history is um, is basically this mystery signal that I, I picked up on some radios I inherited from my friend, but and it sounded. Does anybody have any ideas what that could be? Poxag pager. It's close. Poxag pager. Yay. Um, so, you know, this was quite a while ago, and I, I didn't sort of have knowledge that, that I have got now. But what was interesting initially was that the rate of the messages was changing throughout the day. So clearly, it's linked to some sort of human activity. And um, this was the sort of setup I had at the time. It was connected to um, the very first computer machine I had, 286. And it allowed me to stream the audio across the network as well as control the radios uh, remotely. And I put a web interface on, on that. But um, that would go through into you know, my other computer and I, I began, began to analyze the signal. So that was an FM signal. Basically, if you get a normal FM radio and look at the audio output, it'll look something like this. I'm sure you all know what sine wave is. If you look at it, you can kind of see sine waves of two different if you visualize that, that's the time domain. So if you look at it in the frequency domain, you can see that there are kind of two levels here. And if you, if you recall the sound, there are, it sounds like there are two levels, two different frequencies. So this bit's repeating, and this bit is, is like sort of a nice sound for one continuous wave. And then you've got a mixture over here. As you can see, it looks like there's some different stuff going on here. And so that's known as the preamble, that's the payload. Preamble's very important in radio frequency because it means that the receiver has time to train itself to lock onto the signal, and then you get the stuff. So this is um, the decoder I wrote. It locks onto the two frequencies that it can hear, and then you get a little running graph. This is when it was training, and this is the payload and the data that follows that. Um, so this sort of modulation is known as frequency shifting. You have a board rate, which it dictates how quickly you're sending the data, and then you have you can take out zeros and ones depending on which frequency it is. And this is a visualization of the screen I recorded. I didn't actually know what it was at the time. I just had ones and zeros. Um, so I thought, well, you know, let's try all these different sort of sort of encodings, try each one, see if any, any intelligent information actually comes out. And I had it by chance in this particular mode, and this actually took five years to get to this point because I sort of Worked on it a bit, left it, came back to it. And I happened to be reading an article in, on Wikipedia about Hoxag, Pedro, and it mentioned these magic hex values here. I thought, hey, I'm going to have seen this before. And as it turned out, I, I stumbled upon Hoxag, Pager protocol. And what was interesting is I tried the standard Pager decoding software and it didn't work. As it turns out, they're using a slightly modified version of the spectre frequencies are different, so normal stuff doesn't pick it up. So the key was recognizing those, those, those code words. Uh, some notes on, on hospital pager systems. They use pages because the penetration is a lot better than mobile phones. Um, each 
person carries an ID that's mapped to a radio identity code, and mostly you get telephone exchanges that are sent, so you have to call the person back. Sent by software in the hospital, and um, it's not, not guaranteed delivery, so if you can't hear it, you won't get it. Um, this is your standard pager frequency that's sort of <coughs> universal and shared. Amateur radio people hate it, so it gives you their signals. Um, and this was the this, uh, mystery signal that I was picking up. Um, and this is some standard decoding software. It's important to note that whenever you talk about data in the public domain, you should always um, only show data that's been agreed to be released by all parties. Um, so that's obviously something that we all knew about. Uh, and RF map, let's have a look. Turns out that it's RPA in Sydney or Auckland Salvary Hospital. And the standard frequency is listed there, and the ones that I picked up are listed there. So you can find that kind of information out. What's really interesting is if you click on the links, it actually links to all the other hospitals in the Sydney West and uh, West area health service. So that's a good way of figuring out exactly what's going on. Um, if you look a bit close, uh, you eventually discover the numbers on the end, although they're not seeing we actually relate to the hospital that the message is being sent to or from. So, you know, mostly it's stuff like <laughs> All right, so that's that was my sort of initial foray into it. And I hopefully you got a sort of basic understanding of how you fuel back system works. So let's talk about tracking aircraft. I have to attribute this image to a friend of mine. I thought it was really cool and luckily I could use it. Um, I came down to Melbourne a while ago and I thought, well, I'm going to blue tack a GPS unit to the window. The, um, the steward, steward was asking me during tech, is that off? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Naturally, I blanked the screen. Um, and, you know, this is 10,000 feet in the air, traveling quite quickly. If you map it on Google Earth, then it looks kind of neat. Um, color coded altitude. And so just to give you a, a sense of how uh, the aviation ATC system actually works, um, there are two sort of radar systems. One is the primary, the other is the secondary. This is the big one and the small one. Uh, the primary is sort of your classical radar. The radar sends out a really strong pulse as the, it's rotating around, and it's, it's known as painting skin. So it reflects off the body of an aircraft, comes back, and it listens for it. And by doing that and ignoring ground, ground clutter, as it's known, uh, you can pick up aircraft. Problem is, it's, it's the radar equation, so the losses are actually to the fourth order, which is pretty bad. The secondary system is, is much better because this thing is a directional radio. It sends out an interrogation. It requires, though, that all aircraft have transponders on them. So when it receives the interrogation, it will send back information about the plane. And consequently, because it's a normal radio transmission, it's only second order loss. Let's have a look at the Sydney Terminal Approach radar and map. It's a um, running at 2.85 gigahertz, and they're putting 17,000 watts into it. So it's, it's very powerful. You have to remember that it's, it's directional, so it's not in all directions, it's, it's in one direction as it's rotating around. So it's, you know, obviously this is just comparative, but it gives you an idea of view that it's pretty, pretty strong. Um, in terms of interrogation, there are different sorts of modes. A replies with the, a code, a four-digit code that's sent, uh, assigned by air traffic control. It just basically identifies these markers that would otherwise be anonymous on a radar scope. C gives you altitude, and S is the cool one, because it enables these things called ABSB and ACAS and TCAS. You've probably heard of TCAS, it's the traffic collision avoidance systems and planes that crash into one another. Um, so that's part of the secondary surveillance system. MODES is technically not part of the main beacon system, but they thought, well, we've got this new technology, we're not going to spend all this money on a new rollout, we're going to use the same hardware at the same frequency, so it all operates on the same frequency. AESB, if you've got a plane, it's going to send out a whole bunch of stuff, like that. Um, when your plane is communicating with ATC, vice versa, a, this is cool because you don't have to have that antenna on the rotating dish. You can put them all around the place uh, because they're just radio transmissions, and then that can be linked on a backhaul back to back to the airport. But ATC might ask for a, an altitude request from the ground, and the plane will send it back. You've got two planes 
coming kind of close to one another, then it's a really neat system because they do end-to-air -end interrogations. And if they think they're getting too close, you may have seen in, in videos or flight sims or whatever, um, you'll have that little automated voice come on the, the cockpit saying, traffic. And if you get really close, then it'll say, pull up. And if you disobey the TCAS command, then you're going to be in serious doodum because um, basically it always gets right. I don't know whether any of you might recall that terrible incident in, in Germany where there was a plane carrying all these children and, and another plane they were on a collision course and the um, pilot ignored TCAS and listened to ATC controller and the controller got it wrong, everybody died and then the father of one of the children went and, and knifed the ATC controller. But moving on from that, <laughs> always listen to, to the technology. You know, this stuff is locked down. So let's take a look at um, the mode S sites on RF map. If you put in the relevant frequencies, I think you might be able to see it out there, but it's been cut off here. Um, it's those. You can search by frequency. And these are all of the sites that transmit and receive mode S around the Sydney area for aeroplanes coming in. Um, we won't get into this too much, but basically, this is what a MODES packet looks like. This is time, and it's basically just made up of, of pulses. You can see microseconds here, so this actually takes place in a very, very short period of time. And it's known as PPM. You have to sample the signal at a minimum of 2 megahertz, so it's, it's actually quite fast. If you think about audio cards on a computer, they're a lot slower. You need high bandwidth hardware and quite a bit of processing power. So this is where you get to software defined radio. The whole point of a software defined radio is that it will digitize a raw signal and then you do with it whatever you like in software later on. Um, so you're moving from the hardware domain into the software domain. And the neat thing is that if you need to increase your bandwidth or do more complex signal processing, you just need more CPU samples and CPU cycles, and they're pretty cheap these days. This is everybody's favorite software defined radio. This is actually it here in a nice case. I didn't get mine in the case. Um, but if we have a look, it's neat because you just hook it up to your computer via USB. The newer ones, you can put via Ethernet. Uh, it has a very wide range of sampling, up to 16 megahertz. Um, and if you get a particular daughter board, then you can transmit and receive anywhere between 50 and 2.2. Here you make it in This is neat because you can think of it basically anything in all the right lines, right? Uh, cell phones, basically all this aviation stuff, um, and you know everything. It's the most crowded portion of the spectrum. This is another nice little thing, funky dongle. This is the size, no external power. You just plug it in a USB port. It's much um, narrower, but it's incredibly uh, handy if you want to go out into the field. Once you get the samples into the computer, you need to run some software. This is a, an open source framework. It's incredibly cool. Lots of people work on it. Um, it uses the data flow paradigm, so you just stream the data through blocks. Um, you can visualize, you can do signal processing, filtering, everything. What's really cool though, if you can do whatever you want with it, it uses Python C++, you can build your own blocks, you can build your own programs, it's pretty cool. This is an example, in fact, of your standard AM radio, instead of just having the clock you can listen to on, on in your hand. The USRP connects here, outputs your information, you visualize it by throwing one of these in, and you can send that out your computer speaker by putting one of these in, and that's it. You can make an FM radio receiver, you can make a digital TV receiver. Um, this is actually part of the GSM spectrum, 8 megahertz wide sampling. You can see clearly the broadcast channel there, um, and the traffic channel on the downlink. You see someone's talking, or GPRS or whatever, and then that triggers TV, and it's quite bursty. Um, but they're, you know, 200 kilohertz channels. If you wanted to look at CDMA, say 3G, um, then you could set up USRP and tune it to that. You could look at the next G network, you could look at the GPS constellation, and chuck into this neat block called the fast order correlation signal. And what that does is it looks at the signal and tries to find repetitions in it. For those of you that are familiar with CDMA, will know that when you look at the signal, it's spread out. So usually you can see sort of a peak when there is a signal on the spectrum. This is so spread out that it's very difficult sometimes to tell that there is something there. Especially with GPS, because it's coming up out from satellites that are so high up in, in the sky. The signal is very, very weak. 
But with this thing, you can actually peel back the layers and we'll find evidence of something. And here's an example. If you look at the spec for UMTS, you know there's a, a common pilot channel that um, sends information out about the network at 10 million <laughs> intervals. And if you look carefully here, you can see those green peaks on the 10, 20, 30, etc. millisecond line. So that's the regulates of the CDMA um, 3G signal. Tetra is another standard for digital audio. It's just another example that has a 14 millisecond, 14 point whatever millisecond rendition rate. Um, you can take the USRP out and about. Um, you can set up a, a long wire antenna if you want to receive um, amateur radio transmissions from the other side of the world. And this is a whole bunch of people here talking you know, in all these different countries. You just click on it and you can listen to it. I don't have to turn any dials. And that then can pipe through the software and will decode Morse code. These are people sending Morse code from, from everywhere. So back to aviation now. This is actually the channel um, on which the secondary, on the mode air stuff all operates. And you can see this is this time going up here. And they're constantly sending out all these pulses all the time. They're very wide and quite powerful too. Let's take a look at a mode air signal itself in the time domain. You'll recall that they're all pulses. And you've got your preamble there, you've got the payload there, and this is sort of a visualization of what a decoder might um, be marking. So it's marking the beginning, preamble, beginning of the payload, and then the end of the whole message. Um, it also gets the reference level, the pulses, and so forth. So to actually get the information out of this bunch of ones and zeros, you've got to do all this stuff um, look at the pulses, look at the preamble, detect how long the frame is convert the pulses to ones and zeros, parse it, error correct it, and do sanity checks. Good fun. Lots of different ADSB packet types. They're called extended squitter. You've got the standard stuff that I mentioned before. Um, you've got system information about the ground and aircraft capabilities as well. It will tell you border paths and able to a bunch of other stuff about the aircraft. Um, there's a new one that's not really implemented that tells you where the aircraft is planning on going. Traffic information, that's not really um, that popular yet in Australia. And TCAS. Uh, any of you recognize this film? Oh, yeah. Sneakers? Yes. Car will get the diagnostics. <laughs> uh, this is when they're dialing the, the, the secret encrypted systems at the beginning of the film once they got them in that <coughs> magic black box. Um, and that's, that's when they dial air traffic control. And uh, this is my version. So these are all the planes in Sydney airspace that I can pick up with the system. Um, if you, this is the new version of the trails. The trails color code um, the altitude, so as they're coming, obviously they're all descending into the airport here and taking off again. Um, when you leave it running for a little while, it starts to build up. And this is the program itself. So these are uh, the, the primary runways. You can see the aircraft taxiing about on the um, taxiways. The program also can graph the signal strength of all the aircraft, so you can sort of correlate that with distance and so forth. Um, that connects to the MODIS decoder, it collects all, all the statistics and then it also provides its own internal server of the same check data. Uh, and this is what it looks like when it's sort of sped up, there's a guy taking up there. I think that's the Singapore Airlines flight, yeah, SIA212, guy coming to land, um, other guys have taken off that way. Uh, this guy's coming into land here. Um, but of course, 2D is nice, but it looks much better in 3D, right? And it also looks much better if you had a virtual cockpit view, so you click on a plane and you can see what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's a virtual cockpit view of um, these various flats. There's just one that went off to the right. You'll see a Tiger Airways guy just, just taking off there on the other runway. These balloon pop-ups that are popping up, I'll talk about it later on, but they're messages that are being sent on a different system to and from the aircraft. Um, so I only think the simulation's landing are pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> so these are trails of food. And, and the, the radio is so sensitive that it'll actually pick it up as it's taxiing. I, I watched this guy taxi all the way back to the terminal. And the funny thing is that Obviously, when you're sitting on a plane, it's like the most mundane part of the flight and way and get to the gate and get off the bloody plane. But if you're viewing it, reconstructing in 3D, it's so much more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is another example of, of a land chili flight taking off. 
did this on the bit. So it's, it's, you know, kind of hacked together very early days. It would be nice to get the, the, the tilt and, and what kind of stuff happening, but um, I'm just happy it works most of the time. <laughs> so this is all hooked up. Um, and it, it's not that was actually Google over the app. That was the web plugin, and it's all streamed via JavaScript. And how that came off track. Right. Uh, so a bit of history behind the whole project. Uh, my good friend Matt Robert, who um, you should come see talk tomorrow. Um, I got in touch with him. He had written this post um, that it looks quite doable. This guy had looked into it a little bit. We don't know who he is. It's very secret. Um, who's this joker? Um, this was us setting up a previous demo on the top of my place, and um, this is the note that we put up, just to you know, make sure that, that no one called the cops, because that had happened to me the previous time I was up there. <laughs> I was listening to the International Space Station, and anyway, it's one story. And then we also like, got to the park, take, take out our kit, and the airport's just over there, so it's really, really good view, you can see all the aeroplanes. Um, and this was actually quite surprising because this here, that's not an actually an aeroplane. That's a car that's equipped with a Modus transponder. When the cars actually have to go out and inspect the perimeter, they have to um, carry this so that, you know, the ATC knows where they are and, and planes don't fly into them and so forth. Um, so that was, that was a nice surprise. Don't, I've only seen this twice. This is the first time. The other time it was raining and I was like checking them out. So this is our, our kit. We went a bit overboard with quite laptops. A friend of mine brought this massive battery, like there are six massive SLAs in there to keep us out of power. Um, and this is the Queen, Regal 1. Uh, and the other day I saw Pluto 7, I thought that you might have had something to do with Barack Obama. Um, also, because it's user programmable, people can pick whatever they want. This is actually the state. Um, apparently, this is the setup on the top of the building. This is a, a little way antenna I made that outperforms a really expensive one if I ordered from the States. Uh, and this is what looks inside the actual box. This is my USRP. Um, it's mounted in a, in a pimp and old Bosch electric tool case. Uh, and this is the laptop and power supplies and all sorts of stuff. I'll put a webcam up there so I can see the airport. That's cool because you can see planes coming to land. And you can correlate that with the data that you're seeing on the screen. If you um, do, I um, wrote this before time lapse um, algorithm, then it, it combines all the images so that you can actually see the planes. The trials in real life looks kind of cool at night. Um, and this is kind of the, the setup we've got everything running. As I said, see you playing on the land, if it matches with what's on the screen, you know, it's all good. Now, I've got the radio upstairs on the roof. How do I get it down through the six other computers that it has to pass through to get on on the internet? Um, bore IP. Bore is actually an intentional misspelling of bro, um, long story. But you run this piece of software and you can connect it to a USRP a pumpkin dongle and it will send it um, over Ethernet and you can control it remotely. The newer USRPs have this inbuilt, but the USRP one can not have it. And um, I run gigabit Ethernet down the side of the building, spray painted so nobody can see what it's So TCP UDP. Um, and GNU radio is cool because you just drop it and you don't have to rewrite any code, it all just works. So yeah, all those computers, got the USRP, sending via Bore IP, into the latest decoder, that has a TCP server. You've got the Admap um, desktop app that does the track <coughs> tracking. Then you've got the JSON server that connects to the web app, sends it up by HTTP, through the gateway, AJAX requests get to the web browser and then it's um, Bit of evolution, this is kind of the, the noise flaws as I was iteratively improving the decoder. Um, and I was really happy when I could get it down because it means you can get further range. It's out to about 350 kilometers now, um, given the right antenna. Um, and you can look at, analyze the strength of signal distributions. You can kind of see a, a bell curve happening here in the, um, in the correctly valid decoded stuff. And I guess that's what you would expect of a, of a working system. You've got bad sync and terrible sync. That's for the really big stuff. Um, it works overseas, in America here, they don't have quite the same ADSB rollout as in Australia, so if you only get sort of two planes, that's East Coast and West Coast. Um, back to those balloon pop-outs that I was talking about, that's ACARS, if you've heard of ACARS. 
the aircraft communications and reporting system it's text messaging for planes. They have all, uh, a very wide reaching network around the world. VHF, AHF, the long distance over the ocean, and SATCOM, if all else failed. Um, it's cool because they send out a whole bunch of automated messages and manual messages. So, a cockpit might want to talk to ATC, vice versa, airline operations, or the ground staff. And then you've got really cool stuff like engines and the avionics sending back maintenance and performance information to Rolls Royce. Um, to let them know how things are going, and if anything goes wrong, that they have to go and look at it. Uh, the USRP was there, but I've also got two Funcoo dongles plugged in, both receiving the secondary and the primary <coughs> and frequencies in the area. Um, that's streamed down onto the web as well, and this is sort of a, a, a screen cap shot. Um, and you can see as the aircraft takes off there that it sends out a whole volume messages, and when they land as well, it tends to be very busy when they're on the ground because they're letting the airline know how it landed, this is how much fuel I used. Um, you know, these were the engine vibrations that were recorded and um, some other issues. So you can see that there's a United Arab Emirates one they're sending a whole bunch of stuff. And whenever they send something, they leave a, a dot, and the code is actually the, the code of the message. Um, there's another one, so that's a jet star plane. So some examples. Um, I'm going to show a bit of a bias here, so I don't think it's representative of all my past messages, but um, over time I've kind of got the impression that it's exclusively used for reporting on the conditions of toilets on aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that um, you know, you've got a message there, this toilet's inoperative, and the galley floor is, is it the galley? Is it the galley? Yeah, it's, it's flooded. You got another one. So I'm imagining that that means laboratory. Maybe it means something else. Lots of TLAs in this. And it also gives the kind of, um, the, what's the word? Yeah, you, can have, you can have intermittent errors and then you can have soft failures. And, and the, the labs are always hard, basically. So we kind of joke on another lab hard. And then another lab hard. Uh, and you can imagine how many ACARS messages would have been sent when the Qantas A380 heading home had the, um, the intermittent, what was it, intermittent? Pressure turbine blow up. That was, I don't know if you saw these pictures, but that was a hole that was punctured through the wing and by the engine blew. Um, so that's aviation. Let's look at satellites now. Obviously, these are all terrestrial signals, so if you're receiving things from the ground, um, there's lots of stuff, but you can also point your antenna or your satellite dish up into the sky. Bit of a recap lots of different types of satellites, lots of different sorts of payloads they can carry. Cameras, the weather, for example, they can be moving in which case you need to track them, or they can always be in the same spot in the sky, which makes it very easy to receive. Um, and you also should kind of do a bit of research to figure out the frequencies that it uses. So there are two categories: the intelligent ones, where you need to talk to it and it'll send you interesting data back, or they do it periodically, like the um, measuring the, the weather in a particular portion of the Earth. And there are the dumb ones. And the dumb ones are basically RF megaphones. Quite commonly used for satellite television. Um, you've got a big dish that sends up your satellite TV, sends it back um, on a spot beam to cover a very broad area, which means you can chuck a dish on the side of your house and you've got satellite TV. What is that dumb? So anything that's sent up is reflected back down. Another thing to look at is the tracking telemetry and control and the uplink power control. So that's interesting because often you send commands to a satellite, you might change the configuration, um, turn on a redundant system, change the orbit, check on the health of the, the, the satellite, that's transmitted down using the telemetry. Um, and also, obviously, the weather changes. And if it's really cloudy and the clouds are laden with, with a lot of moisture, then you need to turn up your transmit power on the ground, otherwise it's not going to get through to the satellite, and everybody's going to lose their favorite episode of whatever sort of signal you're watching. So what's interesting to note here, though, is that they usually keep the transmitter power at a minimum to save money, because we're talking about a lot of power on the ground to run the amplifiers to send the signal up. Let's look at an example. This is our friendly Optus D1 satellite in the sky. It's got 24 um, transponders on there. It services Australia and New Zealand. It's got these frequencies on the uplink and downlink. Each transponder is 54 megahertz wide. It's mainly used for TV. 
and there are some other interesting things up there too. If you download the Spectrum Optus, it gives you all the handy information. That there's the uplink control stuff. There, what's that one? That's the telemetry data, <coughs> and that's another. That's the uplink power control beacon. We've got the frequencies all there. So how do they do it? Well, the, all these images are courtesy of um, CNET, publicly available on the internet. This is their Earth station out of Belrose. It's where they send up their signal and, and test that the satellite's working. On our RF map, if you have a look at the assignments there, there are a hell of a lot of them. But you've got all the usual suspects, so if you can't read that, it's Foxtel and Digital Distribution Australia. Uh, so, let's play a game. Spot the satellite modem. This is quite a common uh, satellite modem. It's the DMD15. They've got quite a few. Uh, our picture, if you do a bit of poking around on Google, you can see clearly what kind of equipment they've got. This is tracking the satellite. If you look there, it actually is looking at the C1 satellite and controls the dish to make sure it's properly aligned. What do you need to receive the signals? You need a dish. You need a low noise block down converter. So those frequencies that I had before, 12 gig, is very high. Not suitable for our friendly USRP that works between 50 and 2.2. .2. So the LMB will take it down something that's suitable for this. Um, and you need GME radio. This is an LMB, this is actually a really good one. Whatever frequency you have, you subtract 11.3. And the point is it's really high stability. Cheap ones you get on the roof, they're not that stable. But that's okay because TV is a very wide signal. If you're looking at narrow stuff, you need high stability. Doing a bit more poking around, this is actually a piece of equipment that's on the bird. Quite a bit they actually listed it there. And this is their telemetry downlink, um, power and fire chain, telemetry signals going there, come out, go, come down to the earth. And if you look a bit closer, they're using phase modulation. So that's a clue as to what kind of signal to expect. This is actually the telemetry and the beacon signal coming down from the D1 satellite going through the USRP. This is the, the frequency plot and we know there's phase modulation. Here you've got telemetry sidebands that contain health information about the satellite. You've got um, one pulse per second tones if you were to listen to the big, big, beep, so that you know it's, it's alive. And then you've just got this constant sub carry there. Because it's phase modulation, it's actually a mirror of each side. And what's cool about phase modulation is the carrier is always constant, so you can get some idea of the signal strength coming. Uh, this is actually a visualization of the telemetry data. Um, I've cut it into three, but this is actually one long sequence. And if you do a bit of poking around, you can figure out the speed at which they're sending the data. And I've aligned it to lengths of each frame. So, you know, this is just each um, scan line is a repetition of the previous one. You can see where data remains the same when the data changes. These little dots here are just noise that are crept in. Um, one interesting thing to note. It kind of dawned on me as I was looking at it is, well, what can you gather from this? Not a hell of a lot, but if you're trying to reverse engineer it, then one place you can start is by looking at these curious little things that I'm flashing here. Does anybody have any idea what these kind of um, um, yeah, rotated pyramid style things could be? Remember, these are individual bits. Exactly, the counters. So that's actually just a, a binary number over some series of bits, and it's counting up by one. And if you think about how base two works, that's the kind of pattern you would expect. So you know, it doesn't take that much, but it's, it's something you can expect. Um, you know, so if we look at some other things to actually get some intelligent information out, you've got a whole bunch of things. This is at a different frequency. You can see lots of narrow streams here. Um, and sending stuff up, well, that's straightforward. It goes through a lot of different processes to become suitable for transmission over a satellite. But lots of different parameters that control the forward error correction, scrambling, and so forth. If you're trying to do this blind, right, if you don't have any information about what they're sending down and any parameters, then it's tough. But that's what we like to do. So you ask yourself all these questions and you try and figure out a nice way of doing it so that your head doesn't explode. For those of you that are familiar with strong pad. So first thing you do is you read the load manual. And if you do that, you learn that there are common types of modulation, common convolutional codes used, common scramblers. 
code them up and try them out. Um, I do them automatically. Um, and the cool thing is that with the forward error correction, it doesn't matter if you don't know anything about the data right after that, you can figure out if you've got the right parameters when your bit rate, <coughs> bit error rate is very, very small. Just an aside, um, phase shift keying is commonly used over satellite links. And I won't go into complex numbers and, and that sort of stuff, but phase shift keying means that when you change the phase of a signal, that means if it's a one or a zero. And it's not as simple as taking ones and zeros out. They're the bits, but in this sense, you deal with symbols. And the order of the PSK determines the number of bits in one symbol. So usually, when you have something like binary, then it's just one bit per symbol, that's easy. You can have this QPSK, which means you have two bits per symbol, and you can go eight and it goes up. But the idea is that you can have um, symbols that roll out into a number of bits. So when you've got PSK, you need to figure out modulation order, because remember we're doing this blind, and you need to figure out how quickly they're sending those symbols down. You can do this quite easily in GPU radio. Let's try one. This is um, something I'm looking at. You feed the entire recording into GNU Radio, you use this filter to pick a particular stream out, and what you do here is that you multiply the signal by itself. Sounds pretty easy. When you get the right exponent, this is squared, this is to the power of four, you get these peaks popping out, and that means that you've picked the right order. So this is actually a, a QPSK signal that was in that previous diagram. And that's all you need to do, is this little power block. Uh, if you want to figure out how quickly they're sending the data, then you do this thing called cyclostationary analysis. And I'll show you the blocks, but basically you get the first peak, and that's your good old standard <coughs> serial board rate of 9600. Um, here, what you're doing is you're multiplying the signal by a delayed version of itself, and then you're doing a fast Fourier transform on that. And that has the magic property that, that you find the periodicity in, inside the signal. Um, Forward error correction, well, you pick all your different rates and your matrices and your puncturing codes and all that kind of stuff, and then when you get zero, you know, you get the right stuff. This dog's breakfast of a, of a program is actually what I was just showing you there. Um, I've since compressed this portion of it down into one block, but um, it looks like that, so it's much nicer. And this is cool because it actually will automatically go through every combination. Um, the parameters to find the right one until it gets the long. Um, so that one's QPSK, which means two bits per symbol, so you double the um, rate. The forward error correcting rate has a, this half rate, so you get 9600 bits back out again. And then you visualize the data to look for additional clues. So that's what you get out. That looks really, um, well, it looks like noise, right? It doesn't look like there's anything in there. So you know that it's actually been scrambled. As I said, there are a couple of standard scramblers, so you can use you get something that's like that. There's more structure there, that's, that's good. But you're seeing long strings of ones and zeros, which is not that great. Uh, which means that it must be different, differentially encoded. That means that the same bit that you see means that it's a zero, and if the value changes, then it's a one. So if you do that, things are looking a lot nicer you can clearly see that there are repeating patterns which uh, imply structure and because it, it's an asynchronous link and you should be able to just point your dish out it and the decoder should lock on immediately this kind of stuff would give hints to the decoder saying hey, here's a packet um, so to actually identify what that string is uh, I've got a little program that will pass those bit strings through and find the repeating ones the idea is to try and find a header so you find a sudden increase in the number of occurrences of that stream and that's it there. <coughs> if you actually put it back into audio data decoder, just the raw data, then um, you can clearly see stuff starting to pop out. This is your good old um, character-oriented protocol. These are the synchronization bits. Then you've got a starter header, starter text, header text, CRC, um, you've got their custom header, and then you've got a number of fixed link messages. Each one has an ID that identifies whoever's sending the data. And once you demultiplex all that and list it, this is one particular ID, you see that you've got their header, and then you get some interesting things coming up. So these are measurements that vary over time. There's two minutes worth of, of 
data. Um, and <coughs> these are 16 bit side integers that go between 1600 and positive and negative 1600. And um, this is very recent, so that's as far as I've got. But I was thinking, well, could it be weather? Could it be some utility thing? Could it be, you know, what could it be? There are 11 of these streams, each of them have repeating groups of 18. Um, who knows? If any of you have any other ideas, any ideas, I'm all ears. I'm sure some of you could, could come with some options. So if you know anything, please, please suggest it. Um, so that's kind of the main part of the talk. These slides are in, in red because um, I'm basically recommending that you do not try this stuff. But I've been talking about receiving only. And receiving is generally okay, you've got to transmit, then you need a license. If you want to do that, the easiest thing is to get a hand license. But let's just talk about um, thought experiments here. I'm not going to read too much, but I'll, I'll let you do that. So, what are you talking about? Pages. <laughs> this stuff actually happens, um, so you, you can. This is mode S now, so this is the aviation. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be a sense of pull up. Um, people <coughs> listen to air traffic control and, and do that kind of stuff, there's no particular 
information. The whole point of these communications are safety. I mean, they're ensuring your safety when you go to the airport and get on a plane. That's the primary purpose of it. If you were to transmit, that's a really, really bad idea because it's all about safety. If you're going to upset that system at all, then that's that's really no good. Um, but you know, generally, you know, if you, I won't give you any legal advice, but I would advise you to go and read the Radio Telecommunications Act and the Lawful Interaction Orders the States. What, you know, there, there are a couple of Radio Acts out there that, that you should be familiar with if you really want to know the right answer. Yes. Well, isn't air traffic control a lot of the string live on the web? Yeah, that's true. LiveATC.net or .com, you can listen to air traffic control from all around the world streamed to you via, um, uh, you know, via streaming audio. Uh, just a clarification for the guy I just asked. Provided you're listening to telecommunications, it is technically legal to listen to any radio frequency in Australia. Okay, that's true. I didn't want to go into it too much. You can listen to anything you like, but um, the proviso is that with most stuff, you can only disseminate the information if all parties that were um, in engaging in that communications can send to their Anyone else? Don't take my... my um, Words and the <laughs> okay, what was the functional difference between the little dongle and the? I mean, there's probably a huge functional difference. Right? This can this is has far more branch. It can receive a much wider bandwidth. Um, this is, as I said, 16 megahertz. The other one is uh, 96 kilohertz. So it's much narrower. The range is, is comparable, um, and um, the other one has some some issues. You have to put a filter on the front end, otherwise it gets blown out because powerful signals will easily interrupt it. But it's great because it doesn't require external power in this plug um, I'm really sorry. I was really hoping to show you a live version of Adam Matt because it's actually running right now. Um, what is, um, I'll just try and connect again. Um, Does anyone else have a question in the meantime? Well, I'll just put it up for you. Yeah. Well, it's good. 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 Well, it's but you can get another door to board that will do 2.4 and 5. Um, and then you know you just have to, to write up the right um, software equivalent to decode and stuff. So this is actually streaming live from um, my setup now. Uh, so this guy just took off. Getting out. Um, this guy is I don't know what that guy's doing. Yeah, the idea is that anybody can well, thank you very much, Phil.